Hi guys, this is Steve Moss, pastor at Boulevard Christian Church. God's mission for us here at Boulevard is really simple. We help people find Jesus, and we help people follow Jesus. And our teaching team hopes that this message that you're about to listen to will help you learn to grow and trust Him more than before. If it does, would you consider giving a gift to Boulevard to help us carry out the mission that God has given us? Thanks. We hope your heart is fully open to what God has for you in this message today. Good morning. Yeah, it's good to see you guys this morning. I wasn't sure with all the forecast of rain. You know, there's some preachers that believe with for every raindrop, there are two Christians less who come to church. I don't know whether that's true or if it's been proven yet or not, but you are bucking the trend. So I appreciate that very much. Good to see you guys today. Man, wasn't last Sunday just a great time of celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Yeah, let's see. I th- the, applause, the applause is not for the staff. The applause is for our risen Lord who, uh, who defeated death. And uh, Steve kicked off a new series that we're doing called This is the Gospel. Uh, and this is my week for it. And it's a little bit more uh, uh, background than the uh, other parts of it for, to help us understand a little bit of what we mean by the gospel. What in the world does it mean to, to, when we talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ? And what does that mean? And it's mentioned so much throughout the New Testament, especially uh, from time after Jesus rose from the dead. There's a lot of talk about what the gospel really is all about. And, uh, and, and I think it's so important for us to grasp this right now when we are living in a time with such uncertainty around us. I mean, there are just depression, depressing events that we hear on the news. I, I've just about decided not to listen to the news anymore uh, because it's just kind of gloom, despair, and agony over and over and over again. And I understand that because there are wars and there are rumor of, rumors of wars that keep going around and circling around all the time. And so I think that this series that we're doing on the gospel, because the gospel basically means good news. And what better time in the history of the world right now to be talking about the good news of Jesus Christ. The gospel uh, is called the good news because it addresses the most serious problem that you and I have as human beings. It's what's behind the wars. The serious problem that we have is what's behind all the uncertainty. It's also what's behind not just countries going to war with each other, but the wars that you're having with neighbors and friends and those who used to be friends of yours on Facebook and those who have deleted you and those that you would like to delete. (laughs) So it's all about this good news of Jesus Christ who came within in our world. And that statement that the gospel is called the good news because it addresses the most serious problem that you and I have as human beings, uh, it connects with a little statement that we say quite often around here. We have for years have said, God is God and I am, that's right, God is God and I am not. Say that with me. God is God and I am not. Now, We can say that and it can become a cliche, but there is a real truth about it because we often pretend that we are God. We like to exalt ourselves to the place of God and have his authority. But I am not holy and I am not just, God is. God is full of grace and truth and I seem to either live in grace or truth instead of the combination of both of them, of grace and truth. And God is so many things that we are not and we have got to acknowledge that within our life. It's a pretty profound statement that most of us agree with but every day we struggle with the temptation, I guess you could say, to pretend that we are God. And you know, it's just something that comes over us, over and over again. One of the followers of Jesus, a guy by the name of John, you may know him as Apostle John, and if you've got an older Bible, there's a book that he wrote called The Gospel According to St. John, Uh, but he was a biographer of Jesus. And he said the reason that he wrote his book, uh, the, the, the biography of Jesus, he wrote some other things in the New Testament too, but the reason that he wrote that is because he wants us to understand the good news about Jesus Christ. He said this, these things that, you, that I've written, he said that you may also believe, these things were written in order that you may, what's that next word? 
believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son, the living God. And that by, what's the next word? Believing, you may have life in his name. So in the midst of all the uncertainty that's going on and all the chaos that's going around, Jesus really wants you to have life. And he says another part of John, he says, Jesus said, I came that you may have life and life more abundantly, lots more than even you realize it in that one way. So this morning, we're going to talk about this whole idea of believing. What does it mean to believe? What does the gospel mean? And it says we need to believe the gospel. I want us to find some clarity this morning in what it means to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because, hang with me, when you find clarity in what it means to believe, it will lead you to a confession uh, or statement of your faith and belief. And that confession of faith then places you into a unique community that is very missional. So walk with me this morning as we unpack this uh, whole idea of the gospel, to believe in the gospel, and hopefully in practical ways. First, let's talk just a little bit about giving some clarity about what the word believe means. I absolutely love the song we, we just sang this morning. It's a song uh, that kind of talks about, uh, it's actually from some basic uh, things were written early in the church, church after the Bible was written, as gospel was being spread throughout the world, uh, they needed to have some clarity about what the church was all about, what Christianity was all about. And so they made some statements about the basic tenets of Christianity. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ, his son. And they would make some statements about that. And that became a song in the early church, third century, fourth century church that they sang over and over and over again. And it was funny because you can find the words uh, that we just quoted in this song that was written about it from churches all around the Mediterranean Sea, all the way into the, to, to Africa and some parts of England. You see the words come out of this of songs that they sang. I don't think they had as good a band as we do. They probably sang at Acapulco or acapella, <laughs> and uh, did the polka with it or something of that nature. But, but it's a great statement of some of the, the core beliefs of Christianity. And so this morning we want to talk about this whole idea of believing. Um, it's sort of a summary of the gospel. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son and our Lord. Great statements about the basic message of Christianity. So what does it mean to believe? No doubt if you're a follower of Jesus, you've said at one time or another, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, right? I mean, that's generally whenever you take your confession of faith, that's generally what is asked. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes, I do. When we have baptisms, we always ask the person who's being baptized to say that same thing. It's a great statement. Now, what does it mean, though? The word believe that's translated in our English uh, translations of the Bible is a word, the, the verb form is the word pistuo, the, the uh, noun form is the word pistis, and it can either be translated believe, trust, or to have faith in. And uh, it's used over 700 times in the New Testament alone, just different forms of that. And so it's a, use, a word that's used a lot, but it's the same Greek word for both used, for both talking about belief and trust or faith. Basically, it means something like this, uh, to be convinced of something or to give credence to something, to trust or have confidence in, or to have such trust that you're moved to action. Probably one of the most popular verses in the Bible keys in on this whole idea, the core idea of believing, and how it is so core to you becoming a follower of Jesus. The story takes place in John's biography in chapter 3 of John, uh, where Jesus meets with a guy who is a Jewish rabbi. His name is Nicodemus. They meet at night, kind of in secret, to discuss these things. So it was the first program of Nick at night. Um, you'll get that a little bit later. 
Anyway, so they're, they're meeting together to talk about this, and Jesus talks about being born again, and Nicodemus is scratching and said, what in the chili do you mean about being born again? And he goes, Jesus goes in, and he makes this statement found in John 3.16. Who has ever heard of John 3.16? If you ever watched a football game, if you watched the extra point game, Carrie, there's somebody in the stands that held up John 3.16. Is that a restaurant where you go eat it later? No, it's a part of John's biography about Jesus. And here's what it says. Would you read it with me? Would you say it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever is in him should not perish but have eternal life. Okay, great verse. And he says, your eternal life, salvation, depends the very beginning. It starts with the idea of believing. Verse 17 says this. For God did not send his son into the world to what? Judge the world. But that the world might be, would you save the rest of it with me? Might be saved through him. So belief is connected to trust or having faith in what Jesus has done for us, okay? So belief, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And so we, we kind of get that going. But it's, it's interesting, when Jesus came into the world in the first century, the first century Jewish culture that Jesus came into, the majority of God's covenant people believed that if I observed the Jewish traditions, not only the Ten Commandments and other things that God said in the Bible, the Jews had 617 other things that you had to obey in order to have salvation. Now, just, just a side note, just a second. 617? Are you kidding me? How many of you can keep three rules a day? I wake up in the morning. If I had 617, it wouldn't take me 30 seconds in order to mess up one of them, all right? So it, it almost seems like an impossibility, okay? And so... This was the culture. They believed that you've got to keep these Jewish traditions, these, all these rules. You've got to do every one of them perfectly or else you're out. And that you've got to be born of a, of a Jewish family. And so you had to have the right family and the right rules that you kept in order to have a right relationship with God. But Jesus says, that's not the way it is. You begin your relationship by learning to trust and believe be, in other words, have, have a credence towards or a strong confidence in the person of Jesus Christ. I think there's a similar kind of mistaken trap that we, believe, that we fall in today uh, of what makes people right with God. If a person grows up in a Christian home or not so much anymore, but I can remember in my lifetime where because you were an American, because you lived in the United States of America, you, if you're an American, you're automatically a Christian. That's not true. You know, it, it's, it's not a cultural relationship. It's, uh, it's easy to begin to think that it's all about thinking the right, correct things, but thinking in cor the correct things and being of the right family doesn't get anybody into heaven. Cultural Christianity does not save you. Jesus saves you. Belief in him is what brings about and starts that process of being made whole in God's eyes. Now, so, of what are you convinced of? What do you believe? What is it or who is it that you're placing your trust in? Is it that you come from the right stock? Is it that you're basically a, a good person? that you have done certain religious actions and as a result, uh, you've earned the right to be saved? No, 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 and no. This is a summary, I would say. The God of the universe, Jesus, became flesh to wear my sin and bear my shame. Jesus took his perfect life and offered as a sacrifice for my selfish, sin-stained life as a payment for my sin. He experienced the hopelessness of hell to give me hope of living forever whole. And we trust that to be true. And because we do that, because we believe in that, because we trust that and have confidence in that, we put all of our weight on Jesus and Jesus alone. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 10. He says this, if you, convince, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
Verse 10 goes on to say, for it is by, what's the next word? Believing in your heart that you are made right with God. It is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. What he's saying is, it doesn't matter the family you come from. It doesn't matter your, your position in society. It doesn't matter whether or not you're of the right ethnicity. None of that matters. What matters is whether or not you put your trust totally and completely on the name of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's where it begins. It is not what you do. It's what Jesus has already done for you and your acceptance of that that leads you into that pathway towards salvation. Now, I, I think lots of us think after reading those verses, we think, I can do that. I can say Jesus is Lord. Guess I'm saved then. Pay attention to what he actually says. He says, it is by believing in your heart you've been made right with God. Pistuo, I am convinced, I trust that Jesus is God's only son. I'm convinced that God, he is God in the flesh who came to earth, who paid the debt of my sin, a debt that I cannot possibly pay myself. He died for my disobedience and indifference. I am confident that he came back from the dead and he now resides in heaven. It is more than just understanding the facts. The text doesn't say, I know that Jesus is Lord. It says, I believe within my heart. Now, why is that important? Because this type of belief, clarity about this type of belief, leads to action. Knowing may or may not. Just a quick survey, okay? I'm gonna take a little poll. How many of you know things that you should do that you don't do? Some of you are lying already in church. <laughs> How many of you know things that you shouldn't do that you do do? <laughs> that is a bunch of do-do if you believe that, okay? All right, yeah, okay, good survey there. All right, so it's universal. It's universal to believe that I'm just, if I think about it, it, then it becomes true, but that's not true. Belief is moving myself, it moves me towards an action to know, yeah, I know this, so I'm going to place my confidence, I'm gonna put my weight on Jesus Christ. It is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God. We sometimes mistakenly think that if we're morally good, we practice certain things, we have our list, that we will earn the righteousness that comes only from God. We tend to want to base our salvation on external behaviors. The gospel message is that Jesus Christ has done all the work and we trust and we believe in that. We put our trust, we put our faith, put all of our weight on that belief. Now, clarity about that, believing that Jesus is our only means of salvation, clarity about that leads us to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. So once again, let's kind of go back uh, to this whole idea that about belief leading to confession. Romans 10, 9 once again says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it is by believing with your heart that you are made right with God. It is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. Confession has the kind of the, how am I gonna say, the concept behind it of, of pledging allegiance. Okay. I'm looking through the crowd. I'm looking at ages of people in the crowd. First service we had all primarily of one age. S most of you grew up going to school, putting your hand over your heart, standing to the front at the first of school and making a pledge of allegiance to the flag. How many of you did that? That was before it became un-American to do that. And so, uh, <laughs> funny story. When I was in high school, we had uh, intercom system that went out throughout the entire school. And uh, we had a opening exercises every morning and you stood and you put your hand over the heart and you said, I pledge allegiance to the flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, you know all the rest of it. So we had a kid that was doing it that one morning and he said, would you stand, place your hand over your heart? And he said, bow your heads and repeat after me, our Father, Lord. And all of a sudden he stopped and he goes, O-S-H-I-T. 
which there was loud laughter that went through all the hallways, the Hallett hallway, Hallett hallways of Sapapa High School. And none of us will ever forget that. I mean, at my 25th reunion, at my 40th reunion, I didn't go to my 50th. That story was brought up over and over again. The guy who did that has never been back to Sapapa High School again. <laughs> so, allegiance is something that you say, I believe this is true. I'm pledging my life towards it. Now, I pledge allegiance to the United States when I started school, learned it at home before that. But in December of 1964, I stood before a group of people and I've made a pledge to a higher authority than the country in which I lived. I pledge my allegiance to Jesus who became the authority in my life. In a sense, I switched my allegiance from the country in which I lived to the person of Jesus Christ in a whole different kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Now, I may still confess my allegiance to the country in which I live, the country that God himself placed me in, where I currently reside, but the authority of my life is ultimately not the country in which I currently reside. That day in December, I changed citizenship from an earthly kingdom to a heavenly kingdom to the person of Jesus Christ. Now, one of the significant passages on this whole idea of confessions found in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 and through 16. And it's a story about Jesus with his disciples, the 12 disciples, and they're kind of doing a tour, and they go up to the northern part of... Uh, of Judea, of Israel, into an area called Caesarea Philippi. Now, let me kind of give you a little background on this. It says, now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, now, the reason it's called Caesarea Philippi, this, this district, this area, had been known different things for a long time. It is the headwaters of the River Jordan. It is a beautiful crystal spring that flows up from the ground, just bubbles up, fl comes flowing up, comes out and flows over a precipice. There's a cave behind it, comes down, splashes down, and there are fertile gardens around this area. When I was there, uh, I, don't know, I don't remember, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, the, it was just beautiful. There's, the water spreads out. There are beautiful fields of agriculture in that area and a very arid area otherwise. And there are huge remains of different cultures that have built religious sites there. Baal was the first god that at least we know about that was in that area. And there was a, uh, a, a temple that was made to him. Then when the Greeks came in, they had Pan. There was a temple to Pan. Pan was the uh, half man, half goat. That just proves that men are the greatest of all times, but that's beside the point. Uh, You'll get that about 3.30 this afternoon. And so <clears throat> the, the, the man goat, that's, there was a big temple there. Then Caesar Augustus, Augustus became Caesar. He became king of the world. And so Philip, who was, who was one of the kings that he set up in that area, um, made this huge temple, beautiful temple to Caesar Augustus, proclaiming, just as Augustus said, Augustus said, I am God. And so here's, Je here's Jesus and his disciples. He's surrounded by all these icons, these idols that are there. And he asks a question of his disciples. He says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? What's the word on the street? You're taking a microphone, you're going down the street and saying, who do you think Jesus is? What are people saying? And so here's what the disciples said. They said, some say John the Baptist Pretty cool, John the Baptist preached before, right before Jesus, known prophet. There's one thing about John the Baptist at this time. Do you know what it is about John? He's dead. Next thing it says is Elijah, another great prophet within Israel. You know what it is about Elijah that's true also of, of, uh, John, of John the Baptist? He is what? Dead. All these guys that they mentioned, he says others, uh, Jeremiah, he's dead. So one of the prophets, all these guys are dead. Now, what's conspicuous to me when I read that, nobody is saying on the street that you are the Messiah, Jesus, but you're a prophet. You're something less than that. And so Jesus asked more specifically, next verse, he says, what about you? And it's a question that you and I must answer also. 
What do you think about Jesus? What do you believe about Jesus? Who is he? And they said, Peter answered, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Articles are important. You might want to circle those in your Bible. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, we have heard that, those of us who are sitting in this room, we have heard that over and over and over again to where it just kind of, yeah, so what? When Peter said this, when he says, you are Christos, he's saying, you're the king. You've got all this memorability of all the kings that have been around this Caesarea Philippi for a long time. You've got a huge bust of Caesar Augustus. You've got a beautiful temple that's sent to. And so what he's saying is, it's not these guys that are king. You have authority over every earthly kingdom. You have authority over them. The word Christos has the idea that you are king. Now to be king or Caesar of Rome was a big deal. Rome went from what is now England all the way to India. And if, if, if an uprising came up, a revolt came up within that kingdom, if they were in Rome, it took them two years to get to India. So they had all these outposts of army people who, Rome had one of the most brutal, violent armies that there were. And they kept peace in Rome. They made sure that everybody knew that Augustus was king, that whoever was Caesar, they were the king. His word is law. It meant either your life or your death, one way or the other. His thumbs up or his thumbs down to you meant one thing or the other. And so in the midst of all this, Peter says, as he's standing there in front of all these icons and everything else, he says, you are the Christ. You are the king. You are the son of the living God. You are the king of all heavenly powers. You're the king of all earthly powers. Here's my experience. After 50 years of pastoral ministry, some of you this morning would say, Christ is my savior. I get that but there is no part of you that would call him king. There's no part of you who would actually submit your life to his kingly authority. You might say you think that Jesus is a good guy, but he's not my king. And this, this, there's this weird thing that happens. Now, I, let me step aside for just a second. I'm not talking about baby Christians. I'm not talking about immature Christians. There are things that I, uh, I expect out of my grandkids who are two and three years old. I expect something else out of a 23-year-old. There are different levels of maturity. Um, I think the Boulevard Christian Church should always look a little immature. And we're doing a good job of that. Nervous laughter after that one. Because I think there should always be babies and toddlers and teenagers, literally and spiritually speaking, in any congregation. And I hope that this congregation will always have people at every level of spiritual growth. I pray that we will have people who are always kicking the tires and investigating a relationship with our King and our Lord Jesus Christ. They may have some weird understandings. They may have behavior that we don't think is good or bad, but I hope they continue to come to hear who Jesus is and come to believe, have confidence in him. Now, if you have a bunch of babies running around, what's going to happen? We had a bunch of babies last Sunday in the nursery. There was a call. Please come help. We're dying in diapers back here. What are babies going to do? Make messes, right? Some of them are pretty smelly. I I, uh, This probably is more for guys, but do you remember the first diaper you changed? 
it still brings a knot to my throat that something's coming up. They're messy. They're smelly. But they're babies, and that's what they do. If there are a lot of spiritual teenagers, there's going to be some things going wrong. I've got a granddaughter who just turned 18 and is graduating. Her sister's 15 and a half, and then another one's 13. I've noticed that about 13 or 14, they began to perfect the eye-rolling technique. My 18-year-old, we celebrate her birthday. She was sitting right back from her mother as she relayed a story, and I looked in Piper's eyes, and she was going, <sighs> we have some spiritual teenagers in our church. And teenagers, they often are so self-centered, they don't realize what's really going on. There's some very assertive statements they make about things that they really know nothing about. Not being judgmental, just real. Been around any teenagers lately? Spiritually speaking, you hear lots of opinions coming from them. That is a sign of a healthy church, not an unhealthy one. I believe that we need to have people in every stage of growth that there is. But many of us feel like that Jesus can be our Savior, but we don't need to be submissive to him as our king. It's a foreign concept in the Bible. Early Christians who made this confession of their belief were doing more than just declaring a religious affiliation. When they said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, for a lot of them, that meant a death sentence. But they knew they needed to submit to King Jesus in areas that for a long time in their life they thought were good, and suddenly they find out it's not so good for them. It is a lie of convenience when you say, I'm claiming Jesus as my Savior, but I'm not going to be, have my submission to him being king. It's based on a consumer culture to believe that we can have the benefits of salvation without paying the cost of following Jesus. And frankly, some of you don't see Jesus king at all. You have fire insurance. Perhaps in grade school or in junior high, you saw some scary sketch or heard a story being told, and you, it scared the hell right out of you. And you wanted fire insurance. But you didn't want to submit to Jesus. Or your mom and dad found value in your baptism, and they talked you into something that wasn't in your heart yet. Now, please, please hear me on this. I'm not saying that we are perfect in our obedience our obedience to the kingly reign of Christ. I'm not saying that. If I were, I would not be a Christian. But we must understand that there are two sides to the coin of Jesus being Savior. He is also our Lord. Oftentimes I sit down and talk with kids who are wanting to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And one of the questions I ask is, do you know what sin is? And they generally look at their mama, and they go, mm-hmm. It means when I don't do what mama tells me to do. Then I ask, have you ever done anything wrong? And they look at their mama again, and they say, no, sir, I've never done anything wrong. I know that they're not quite ready to take that step. Because if you do not understand the reason that Jesus went to the cross is because you have sinned, then you don't need a Savior. And when you're accepting him as Savior and Lord, you're understanding, I've been stupid. Anybody here been stupid? Once again, some of you guys are, got this lying problem. I, I'm stupid a lot. That means I need my Savior a lot. 
And I find as I begin to accept his kingly authority, I become more aware of my stupidity in my life, my sin within my life. Whenever I make that decision and I believe and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, it moves me to being placed into a community of Christians. Our personal confession places us into a community of followers who believe the gospel. Followers of Christ, we are a community who entered the fray to push back the darkness. While we exist as a church is not only to become mature, yes, that should be a part of it, but we're also involved in pushing back the darkness that is overtaking the world. We enter the darkness by living by like Jesus. We engage. Believers are not defined, listen to me, we are not defined by our ivory towery cleanliness. We are defined by our open-handed dirtiness that serves other people who are hurting and broken and make messes, and we walk with them through those messes, and we help push back the darkness. We do not grieve the brokenness of this world behind high walls with gun turns that we're going to shoot the broken. That's not what we do. We know people are broken. You know why? Because we're broken. That's why we need a savior. And so we reach out to the broken and we share the good news because we know the power of Jesus to heal and restore. Amen? One of the drifts that invariably happens in communities of believers is we drift to wanting to become prettier and prettier and prettier people. We, we want to act like we don't have those problems in our life. We want to act like we don't have issues within our life that are still being healed by God. And friends, that is not what God desires from the church. He wants us to admit that. He wants us to be open with that because that connects to other broken people while we're acting like, well, I don't sin, and they know good and well. They see our lives. All we're doing is drown them when our own snot comes down the back of our throat when we do that. Sorry for the graphic illustration. Maybe I'm not sorry, okay? May Boulevard Christian Church be marked by open-handed generosity of our time and our resources that will cause people to stop and consider the leader and forgiver of our lives, the one that we believe in. That is the mark of community of believers. I want to make an appeal to you this morning. Some of you are here because a person invited you. I had a great conversation with a person after first service. He came last week because a person invited him and he had some, some big time questions this morning. It was a good conversation. Perhaps you just stumbled in here this morning. That's probably the reason you're at second service instead of first service, you know, when you stumble in, you get up and go, hey, I think I'm going to go to church. You generally choose the second service. Others are here because you have an inward craving to believe in someone or something. I think you're craving a king. You've tried to be the king of your own life. You've tried to rule and reign and do what you think is right. Now hear me on this. Please please know that I, I love you and I care about you but by being, trying to be the king of your own life, you've made a mess of things. There's chaos and drama that follows you wherever you go. Things are in shambles all around you. Maybe it's in relationships. Maybe it's in your family. Maybe it's at work. You've tried to rule. Perhaps you've even tried to rule with a good heart. Yet your world is falling apart. And I'm not trying to disrespect you in any way. Just realize there's a better king than you. Is full of grace and truth. So the offer on the table this morning is a king. It's a life that can be lived to the full. I'm not saying it's a life of ease. I wouldn't lie to you. I'm not promising you there's going to be a life where, bam, everything magically gets healed and restored and everything's fixed overnight. That would be a lie. I'm saying that you are designed to live a life and to walk in a life that can be full of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness things that you thirst for and long for in your life. Most of us have tried to be king and it's gone badly. So the offer is on the table that there's a better king and his name is Jesus. 
And when you come believing in your heart that he is the only source of real life, he meets you there. And you begin your journey towards wholeness when you, stay, when you come to believe and have confidence and you put yourself, you put your weight in, on him. I know there are others listening this morning and, um, and you're your own king. And it seems to be going quite well, to be honest, you know. You're riding high. But here's what's interesting. When we're in that position, we think, I'm a good person. And we like it when people say, he's good people. And you look around and you think, if God is upset with anyone, it couldn't be me. It must be one of those other people that I know who are worse than I am. Because I'm great. Just just this last week, I, I heard this. And you've all heard it in some form for years. And I, I, I really want to be able to uh, ask gently this follow-up question. By what standard are you judging your goodness? Now, when I ask that question, there's generally one of two responses. When I'm brave enough to ask it, what, what's your standard of judging that you're a good person? This is the first response. Crickets, silence. I, I don't know. Or the other comeback is generally a mention of people they know who are worse than they are. And if that's your response, then you're judging your goodness by the wrong standard. Let, let's just just a moment, real quick, test that idea. Do you do you uh, you ever find yourself telling a lie? to cover the misrepresentation that you told earlier. You may not be defined by lying, but again, you might be. You lie. You image build. I tick down this down on Facebook because my hair's not right. Don't have the right things on it. You image build. You're wanting to present an image. You lie. Do you covet? Do you find yourself rejoicing when bad things to happen to people you think bad things should happen to? Yeah, man, way to go, God. You finally got them. I've been waiting on you to do that. Or do you find yourself angry and resentful when good things happen to people that you think should not have good things happen to them? And you're going, why is God doing that? You're coveting. You're making yourself out to be God. What about lust? Well, not lately. Well, the Bible has a thing to say about that. So the standard is, is what you think in your heart, in your head. See, God's not after shaped actions. He's after a new heart. But you're good, right? You're a coveting liar who lusts after other people, but, but you're good, right? What about anger and rage? Any explosions of anger that rises up from frustrations? Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not dogging you, you're great. I mean, at this point, you're a lying, coveting, lust-filled, angry person. But next to your brother Bill, you're crushing it today. Let me tell you, you're crushing it. Some of you in your own pride have exalted yourself to a place of loveliness that is just plain blasphemous. And I'm simply trying to make an appeal that you end this rebellion that will lead to your eternal destruction and instead submit to a gracious king who has not come to condemn you, but to save you from shame and condemnation of your own making. You have walked into this building, perhaps with feelings of shame and insecurity and unworthiness. And I know there's some... I talk with them on a regular basis, but James, you don't realize I've done this, 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 and this, and you're right, I did not realize that. But it's not up to me. You're, you're never too far gone. And I praise God for that because there's times I felt like I was too far gone. You're never too far away from the grace of God. The good news is for you. 
the atoning work of Jesus on the cross is so total, listen to me on this, in its forgiving, merciful, extending properties that all sin for those who believe and put their trust in his life, death, and resurrection, all their sin, all your sin, past, present, and future are fully absorbed in the death of Jesus Christ and his defeat of death in the resurrection. The message of the gospel is not that we have done anything. It's that we believe in Jesus who has done everything. And when you believe in him, when you respond to his goodness by submitting yourself to the king, he saves you and gives you hope now and forever. In just a moment, you will have the opportunity to respond. You'll have the opportunity if you've got needs within your life to be prayed with, to prayed for, prayed over, to be encouraged in your desire to follow Jesus or in your desire to desire to follow Jesus. Our decision coaches will be on each side of the auditorium ready to walk with you and describing what your next step for your desire or your desire to desire to have Jesus become the leader and forgiver of your life. I ask you to come after our prayer this morning as we sing and have a conversation with a decision coach. Shift your belief, shift your trust from yourself to the person of Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, we, we thank you for your goodness and grace. We thank you, Father, that you are the strong, mercy-filled creator of this universe. Father, you are the only one worthy of our belief and our trust I ask that you hear the voices of those crying out to you this morning. The voices of those who have tried to be their own king and their own God, and it's not going well. This, this is a brokenness all around us and in us. Father, we've tried to fix it, and it's just become messier and messier and messier. And so, Father, may your spirit do a work of clarity in our lives right now. We can't, Father, but you can. So we submit to you right now in Jesus' name, amen.